by the way you can you can you can actually expand the screen at the end yes i will ah uh, okay okay yeah yeah because then it will be okay more participants okay hello like hello ah uh, yeah hello everyone uh, good morning again this is the fourth and the last lecture on the capital particularly on primitive accumulation so like the last three lectures uh, the capital series would be done with this uh, lecture with professor patu chatterji after this uh, the next two lectures would be on uh, uh, on violence in the state and the wild state and violence so over to professor patu da and uh, welcome and have a good day patu da over to you yes okay uh, so good morning uh, <clears throat> we will continue with our discussion of uh, primitive accumulation which we started last time as you all know this is from the last part of capital volume 1 which is which is called uh, the so called primitive accumulation we went through the history of uh, uh what's that thing okay uh now uh we went through the history of how this term primitive accumulation came into circulation in in the english version of uh uh capital volume 1 uh because it refers actually if we go back on yeah it refers actually to smith's adam smith's discussion of how uh factory production that is to say capitalist production actually originates or begins and smith called this the previous accumulation right which was in smith's terms it only required the accumulation of stock that precedes the division of labor and so whenever some owner of wealth or stock in his uh, in smith's words stock here means that not been uh shares in the market this is the, you know that stock exchange is not what is being referred to that was still in its uh, very origins at the time when smith was writing um uh, stock by stock he means stock of capital that is to say money wealth and then uh implements the means uh machineries that is to say uh and when someone has this and then decides to initiate a division of labor in the process of production which will improve the productivity of labor that is to say more will be produced with less labor that is the whole point of division of labor and in adam smith's uh, argument about how factory production or industrial production uh is so much superior in terms of producing uh wealth for the nation right uh he identifies essentially the principle of division of labor as the main dynamic of this accumulation process so as the process of production itself is divided up into parts and each part becomes the specialization of a particular branch of labor okay and the whole thing is then put together or assembled within a factory that is the role of the entrepreneur or the capitalist and that is what uh produces capitalist industrial production now marx is referring to smith's account of previous accumulation and basically arguing that smith is actually wrong that that is not the origin origin because simply an accumulation of stock will not necessarily lead to this whole process that smith is describing because the crucial thing that will be left for the capitalist to find is the supply of labor where is he going to get the workers who will be willing to come to a factory and work in return for wages where is that supply of labor because in a pre industrial economy presumably most working people are engaged 
in some kind of primary production themselves. Either they are peasants who have their own free land, which they cultivate and provide for the subsistence of their own families, or they may be dependent farmers who are dependent on tenancies that are let out to them by their landlords. So they have to pay rent to the landlord, but nevertheless, the subsistence of their families are provided for, even through this dependent labor. labor. There are craftspeople, artisans, right? Who will own their own means of production. So there may be you know, individual uh, weavers who weave at their homes, but they own the means of production that they have. The, the looms and, uh, and they get a supply of the raw materials and they have a, a set of customers uh, to whom they sell. So there are no, there would be no laborers who would be willing to come and join a factory. Why should they do it? So for this, and this is Marx's crucial argument then, the three key conditions that will be necessary. First, the direct producer must be dissociated from his or her means of production. Okay. So that's the first condition. Second, the means of production must come into the possession of the capitalist. So if it is land, the land will come into the possession of the capitalist. If it's other implements, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, they will come into the possession of the capitalist. Finally, the former peasant or artisan now becomes a propertyless wage worker selling his or her labor power. Okay, that's the key feature that Marx identifies. This is missing in Smith's account. And this is, these are the features that Marx will then trace in this chapter, uh, historically. How did these conditions emerge, specifically in the case of England, which Marx takes to be the classic case of uh, this kind of transition. So, <clears throat> So again, I'm going through this rapidly. Uh, the emergence of free workers is therefore a necessary condition. The workers become free in a double sense because they are neither means of production for others, as would be the case in a slave economy where the slave is himself or herself a means of production, or serfs who are dependent laborers who are means of production as far as uh, the landlords are concerned. or no, so the uh, wage worker is none of this, nor do wage workers own the means of production themselves. Now, two historical preconditions that creates the, or created this mass of free workers in England, and these are emancipation for serfdom, so that dependent condition of laborers is gone. So laborers who earlier serf peasants are now on their own. Okay, so it depends on whether or not they have their own land to cultivate, but they are no longer dependent. So they cannot depend on uh, some kind of traditional bondage or dependence uh, or traditional relationship of uh, give and take with the landlords on which they depended for their subsistence. That's gone. But do they have their own land? Well. Some of them did manage to get own land, but in time they were expropriated from this land. They were thrown out, right? How did that uh, expropriation take place? Marx will describe this. But this, these two historical processes, this creates a mass of free, unprotected proletarians without any property, property less. Proletarian is precisely that word. It, it's an old Latin word, but it comes to mean from the 19th century, and this the entire socialist literature from the 19th century is will use this term for industrial workers. They are proletarians without any property. How did the expropriation of free peasants take place? Well, through confiscation of church lands during the Reformation, because there were free peasants who were working on church lands, but these lands were taken away by the state 
uh, the crown, that is, the abolition of feudal tenures on land. So where landlords would have given out tenancies to peasants, that's no longer there. And finally, the enclosure, enclosure of common lands, lands that were traditionally meant to be uh, used by everybody, which was crucial in terms of the peasant agricultural economy because the common lands is where mm, farmers, uh, everybody in, or in the village would graze their farm animals of different kinds uh, without any cost, but that is gone. Now, note this particular uh, set of, uh, uh, sorry, uh, explanations, because we will come back to this uh, in a few minutes. All of those expelled from the land could not be immediately absorbed in urban uh, manufactures. So they had to be controlled. How? Because what they were doing would be, essentially you'll get people who had been evicted from their lands. They had no means of subsistence. So basically they would just leave their villages and try and go into towns in order to find some livelihood. Okay, even if it's just begging, right? We are very familiar with this phenomenon. There's nothing uh, strange about this, but in England, in, in let's say the uh, 17th, 18th centuries, this was actually quite common because large numbers were being expelled from their traditional occupations and were flo uh, flocking into the, the towns. <laughs> so there were laws against vagabondage. Vagabonds, there were laws which allowed the police and other authorities to arrest vagabonds. They were either sent out of the town or they were put into workhouses. They, initially, they were just put in prison. Uh, but then the proposal came, why just put into the prison? Because that actually adds to the expenses of the state because they have to be fed in prison. So open workhouses where these people will be forced to work in return for uh, their uh, subsistence. Uh, so these were workhouses which were opened by the state, right? by government agencies or local agencies. Sometimes there were uh, uh, businessmen and philanthropists and so on who gave money to open these workhouses where the poor could be housed. Uh, don't forget, I mean, there's a whole political history alongside because if there were uh, vagabonds floating around in the cities, the people who were most concerned were in fact the wealthy because they were the ones who were most vulnerable because of theft, stealing, burglary, uh, all you know, these kinds of so. So what, what were called crimes against property. This is one of the most interesting things that happened in 18th century England that crimes against property go up uh, and so this, these are various methods by which this was sought to be controlled. Then there was sending them to penal colonies uh, and most prominently Australia, where criminals of different kinds, people, uh, criminals were most often, often petty criminals. They were just packed into ships and sent off to Australia where they were given land where they could, uh, in a sense, make a new life as it were. But away from England, long, long distance from England. Uh, and then there was this peculiar uh, phenomenon of maximum wage legislation, laws which prohibited employers from paying more than a particular uh, amount. Okay, this, of course, as we know, in the 19th century, would change completely because you would, and even today, you have minimum wage legislation, which is. Uh, a minimum amount that everyone must pay, whereas this was maximum wage legislation. Uh, <clears throat> okay. Now, what? who replaces the old direct producers? The capitalist farmer, <clears throat> that's the new institution, yeomen or gentlemen farmers, they would be called. Uh, they uh, were different from the earlier peasant because the capitalist farmer would produce entirely by wage employing wage labor. The capitalist farmer was not a worker himself, right? He would employ wage labor 
to carry out the entire production. Second, his entire produce was for sale in the market. Okay, he only produced, there is no question of meeting his own subsistence uh, as the, old, uh, the earlier peasant. And this happened in England mainly because of the rising demand for wool, capitalist farmers leased in agricultural lands and converted them into sheep farms. And it, in order to do this, this, this new capitalist farmer was prepared to pay more rents to the landlords who owned the land. So the landlords became interested in clearing out commons and if, they, if, if, they, if, if it was possible in throwing out their earlier tenants and handing over this land to the new capitalists, the new sheep farmers, because they were prepared to pay more rent on that same land. <clears throat> now, when you have no longer have uh, the same number of direct producers who could find their own subsistence, right? Who grew or produced their own subsistence, then that would create a pool of wage laborers, right? which would constitute a home market for products of capital. Because these people, all these people who had been thrown out of the land or could no longer uh, uh, support themselves on their craft production, right? They were now forced to buy everything from the market. All their means of subsistence had to come from the market. So the destruction of rural domestic industry is a necessary condition for now, it's not as though there was no wealth, right? In pre-industrial society, there was, there were wealthy people. Who were these wealthy people? There were money lenders, usurers, and there were merchants, traders. And some of them were very wealthy, right? And they existed in the towns of feudal Europe. They were there for a long time with their own organizations and so on. Uh, but because of the feudal system in the countryside, and the artisan guilds, that is to say, associations of craftspeople themselves who controlled that, that production, they could not become industrial capitalists. Once again, even though they had wealth, they could not enter or take over the process of production itself because agriculture was controlled by uh, the class of feudal lords and uh, manufacturing in the towns was controlled by the guilds of artisans themselves. But wealth accumulated in this whole period of this transformation through gold and silver mining in America, the plunder of India, the hunting of slaves in Africa, plantation colonies in the Caribbean. All of this contributed to primitive accumulation because they led to the accumulation of merchants' capital in Europe. The role of the state, the role uh, the state did play a part. Although the capitalists themselves, in the English case, they were independent entrepreneurs. They used the market forces, market relations, in order to uh, create the conditions, right, which uh, where they could take advantage of this process of expropriation from the land, the creation of a pool of wage workers in the cities, they would take advantage of this in order to uh, create their factories and launch industrial production. So these are precisely independent capitalist entrepreneurs. But in the, in, in the prior condition, which is the breakup of feudal society, the breakup of serfdom, of those ties of dependence, etc. That required the force of law, right? And some of this, like for instance, the, there were all kinds of laws that were passed to enable landlords to take over the common lands. Okay, there were laws which facilitated this. Uh, there were laws, as I said, uh, to control vagabondage, et cetera, et cetera. Another one which Marx points to is the public debt. And the public debt, that is to say, the borrowings of the state, the borrowings of the monarch, 
That kept going up in this entire period because of the huge expenditures in war, warfare. This is the period, so the 17th, 18th centuries, all the way to the Napoleonic Wars, and in fact, all the way into the 19th century. Uh, there were all the states in Europe were more or less involved in constant warfare. And so the state had to raise huge armies, uh, huge expenditures in war, for which they borrowed. They borrowed money from, uh, basically from the market. Uh, and this debt had to be repaid by raising tax revenues. And in those days, and in those days, the principal tax revenues were taxes on commodities, on various commodities that were sold. I mean, income tax was, was very, very recent. Uh, I mean, today, for instance, we, we, most states depend on direct taxes, which is taxing of direct income, whether incomes of corporations or incomes of individuals. But this was not the case uh, well into the 19th century, where the large part of the revenues of the state came from uh, taxes on commodities, uh, buying and selling of various things, almost everything uh, that was bought and sold in the market had some kind of taxes that needed to be paid. And this, it's very well known that indirect taxes are disproportionately, there is a burden on poorer people because the poorer people have to spend a larger part of their income in buying things from the market, which are their basic necessities. A very large part of their incomes are spent simply buying things from the market. And so if most of those commodities that they purchase from the market have a tax, then clearly poorer people disproportionately compared to their incomes, they, uh, they uh, are hurt much more. And so this leads over time to this contributes to the pauperization of small owners. Basically, their costs of uh, subsistence keeps going up. So here the role of the state was crucial in capitalist accumulation. Marx also <clears throat> speaks very cryptically and briefly on primitive accumulation in the colonies. Uh, as we know, uh, in Western Europe, primitive accumulation more or less was accomplished by the middle of the 19th century, but not so in the colonies. In the white settler colonies, that is to say, mostly the Americas, Australia, New Zealand, um, parts of South Africa, uh, these were white settler colonies. That is to say, these were places where European immigrants essentially colonized those lands by through conquest. Uh, and, um, and in those white settler colonies, think particularly of the uh, Canada, United States, cheap land meant that most settlers were small owners. So as I explained to you last time, most of these people who left uh, Europe were actually not, not, they were not people who were carrying a lot of money with them when they went. They were they had to leave because life was so difficult in, in, in Europe. Uh, and so they left. Uh, they arrived in the US uh, almost penniless. Very, very few people had much money with them. But because land was abundant in these colonies, the colonial officials basically arranged to distribute free land to uh, the immigrants. They were given these pieces of land where they cultivated, they organized production there, largely as small owners who were interested very largely in the subsistence uh, of their uh, own families. But then this led to, as we know, enterprise, what was called enterprise among the small owners. Some, they, they essentially competed, uh, some managed to either through hard, hard labor or through greater skills, innovation, things like that, uh, to actually accumulate capital and become wealthier. They had larger plots. They had you know, bigger farms, uh, et cetera, et cetera. This, was, this is the classic American story of success, right? Start, start, an immigrant comes in, a poor immigrant who has nothing, who just is given a piece of land and then through hard work and, and uh, 
uh, and, and cleverness essentially uh, manages to be successful. Now, but there were no wage laborers here. So again, the, the big question that emerges in the 19th century when you already have uh, industrial revolution well underway in, in Britain, right? Uh, in the United States, for instance, or in Canada, there was still very little industrial production, largely, once again, be, uh, not because they were not wealthy people, but because there were no free laborers. And so what kind of labor was available uh, to be employed? And there was plantation labor, of course, in, uh, which was supplied by African slaves, uh, historically. Uh, after the abolition of the slave trade, indentured laborers, laborers were brought in from India into the Caribbean, the West Indies, into Mauritius, into Fiji. These were all plantation economies, which earlier would have run on African slave labor. But after you know, 1820s, 30s, the slave trade was banned. Uh, so this is, this is the origin of the uh, large Indian populations that you still have in many of the West Indian countries. Uh, Marx also discusses this curious attempt at systematic colonization, which is to say, create a class of free laborers, wage laborers in Australia uh, by not giving these laborers free land, but making them compulsorily to work as wage laborers for enterprising capitalists. It, this didn't quite work. Uh, there was the systematic colonization proposal didn't quite, but Marx raises this precisely to point out this, once again, his basic argument that without the supply, a large pool of free workers, propertyless workers, you cannot have industrial capitalist production, right? Even in these white settler colonies, you did not have them until a supply of uh, free laborers became available. In the United States, this happened, of course, once you have uh, the slavery is abolished in, in, in the American South after the American Civil War. And then you begin to get the movement of the freed African-American population into the towns of Northern United States. And that is where you then get uh, factory production starting in the late 19th century. In the early 20th century, you begin to get mass immigration of free laborers from Europe. Uh, but this did not happen until the early 20th century. Okay. Now, let's move to the next set of discussions on primitive accumulation, as I said, that in the European case, uh, accumulation, primitive accumulation was more or less accomplished by the 19th century. But in recent times, the discussion on primitive accumulation has been renewed. Uh, one was because of David Harvey's discussion uh, of what he calls accumulation by dispossession uh, in his book, The New Imperialism. Uh, we'll, I, I will talk about this briefly at the end of today's class. And then we have more relevant for our purposes, Kulan Shannal's discussion, uh, which is more relevant in understanding contemporary capitalism in post-colonial countries. That is, That will be largely our topic today. <clears throat> now, Kulan Shannal has extended Marx's discussion of primitive accumulation in the context of contemporary capitalism. What he's arguing is that several things have now emerged in contemporary capitalism, which were not uh, so apparent in the 19th century. By turning our attention to capitalist development in post-colonial countries, we gain a new angle for the analysis of capitalism in Europe. So this is one very interesting implication of Shannal's work that he, by turning our attention to what is happening in countries like India, for instance, today, but many other post-colonial countries, uh, he is actually pointing to 
certain features of primitive accumulation in Europe, which were not very clear in the 19th century and which don't appear in Marx's analysis. Marx was not quite aware of those features, but Chanal's argument is that they were there, even though they were not very apparent. So the crucial <clears throat> question was this, Marx and Engels, especially in, in the Communist Manifesto, which was written in 1848, several years before Capital. Uh, in the Communist Manifesto in particular, which is more like a programmatic statement, uh, Marx and Engels described <clears throat> the, the global spread of capital as breaking down what they called the Chinese walls of traditional society, right? And transforming pre-capitalist institutions in its own image. There are several very uh, remarkable line sentences in, in, in Communist Manifesto, which basically says that capital is, uh, is, is just uh, um, leveling down all of these traditional institutions in many of these countries. Uh, the Chin Chinese illusion uh, becomes particularly apparent because China was well known for essentially preventing foreigners from coming in to their uh, societies. Uh, there were all kinds of ways, but Marx was saying this is, these uh, attempts to protect traditional economies was, was, was crumbling. These, these attempts would not succeed because capital would simply transform them into institutions built in its own image, built, built like capitalist institutions. But from the evidence of post-colonial capitalism, Shannal questions this proposition. He argues that capital often retains and sometimes even creates forms of labor and production that do not belong to the domain of capital. So Shannal thus questions the narrative of transition from pre-capital to capital. Now, you have to be careful in, uh, in, in uh, uh, understanding what Shannal is saying here. He's not simply saying that capital fails to break down traditional institutions. In other words, he is not simply saying that even though there is contemporary capitalism, a lot of pre-capitalist institutions and pre-capitalist forms of production or exchange still continue. See, that is not what he's saying. He's saying that traditional institutions are being broken down. Traditional institutions and practices are changing, transforming, but they are not necessarily all being transformed in order to be included within the domain of capital. So there are new things which are emerging, which are not traditional, but they are not capitalist either. So this is the interesting argument. Okay, he is not saying that pre-capital simply survives, right? He is saying that capital in fact intervenes. One, of course, to create conditions so that capitalist accumulation can go on, but it also intervenes to create a, a, another domain which Shannal will call non-capital. There is a domain of non-capital, which is also produced by this transformation. Okay, now how does this happen? Primitive accumulation means, and we've seen this, that labor is separated from land to become free wage laborers. We know this. When this process is complete, capital becomes self subsistence. Now, what does that mean? It means capital simply reproduces itself. It continues accumulation, it reproduces itself. It does not need another outside sphere to break down anymore. Primitive accumulation is complete. Okay, capital now simply continues to reproduce itself through accumulation. And of course, this is this was Marx's great argument in, you know, go back to where uh, yeah, 
Each mode of production gives rise to contradictory forces and creates conditions for its own destruction. In capitalist production, technical progress leads to the centralization of capital. This in turn leads to the socialization of labor and lays the basis for cooperation in production. This creates the historical condition for the expropriation of capitalists by socialized labor, right? So it is through the process of self-reproduction of capital that ultimately this conflict between capital and labor will take place. That is Marx's uh, presumption or, or his prediction for the future. So, but capital and labor are both parts of capitalist production. It is not a conflict between the capitalist sector and some other sector, because there is no other sector, right? So this is what would what is supposed to happen when uh, capital becomes self subsistence There is nothing left outside capital. Now, this is Shannal's question. What if all peasants without land cannot be employed in industry? What if there is an absolute, not a relative, surplus labor. And this is where the uh, difference with Marx emerges. Because once again, uh, we can go back to this question, which Marx, in fact, did not forget to consider. Because he does raise this question, all of those expelled from the land could not be immediately absorbed. Okay, so they had to be controlled, and there are all of these methods by which they are controlled. But this population, which is not immediately employed, nevertheless remains available to be employed. Okay, they remain available to be, to be employed. This is called a relative surplus population. Marx often refers to this as the reserve army of labor. And this reserve army of labor is there because of the fluctuations in the conditions of industrial production. There are times when industrial production is growing rapidly, so there is need for more and more labor to be employed. So these are this is the reserve army that is always available. You can call upon these unemployed people, temporarily unemployed people, to be employed now. And then if for whatever uh, market reasons, production uh, falls, and labor has to be retrenched, right? They are thrown out of work. They rejoin this, this reserve army, uh, which, is, which is there, which is the army of unemployed people. But Shandal is not talking of a reserve army. He is speaking of a population which is an absolute surplus, which is never to be employed, or which can never be employed, okay? Now, why can why should that happen? What if there is an absolute, not a relative, not relative surplus labor? And this is where one comes to back to the question of the what we might call the political management of primitive accumulation. Right? Primitive accumulation leads to considerable disruptions in economy and society. So how was this politically managed in the 18th century, in the 19th century in Europe when this was going on? We have spoken of the role of the state. <clears throat> how was this political management carried out? Marx's account is incomplete because there was an absolute surplus population created by the rise of capital in Europe. This surplus population was politically managed through emigration and deaths in war, famines, and epidemics. Now, this is very largely not considered in, in, in Marx. Uh, emigration out of Europe, which we know was largely among, from among the poorest uh, people in Europe, essentially precisely the victims of primitive accumulation. And then you have deaths in war, famines, 
and epidemics through this entire period when capitalism is emerging in Europe. Between 1815 and 1920, so in about in roughly 100 plus years, 60 million people, uh, 60 million Europeans migrated to the Americas. This is a figure we know, right? There may be others going to other places, but we know these figures of emigration to uh, the Americas. 60 million Europeans migrated to the Americas. Now, 60 million, you think of European populations, right? The population of Britain today is 60 million, today, right? So it is, it is the size of a large European country today. That's, this, that's the population that actually emigrated to North and South America uh, from Europe in, in those 100 years, precisely the years of, uh, of, of uh, capitalist industrial uh, revolution. <clears throat> a million people died in the Seven Years' War, which is in the middle of the 18th century. Uh, five million died in the Napoleonic Wars. That's to say early 19th century. 20 million died in World War I. And 50 million died in Europe alone in World War II. And it's not difficult to claim that uh, most of them would have been among poorer people because most soldiers would have come from, even though there was conscription, of course, uh, but the bulk of the people who died uh, in these wars were among, came from the poorer people. So in a sense, what was happening is that population was actually being reduced through this process. This is essentially the political process of warfare. Okay. So what might have been a, an absolute surplus population, part of that was in fact managed this way politically. If you think of this in the long historical, of course, no one is claiming that this is what was in the minds of uh, political leaders when they went to war, that we must reduce population and kill off some people. That's not, that's not how history moves, right? It was, these were not conscious decisions taken with this long-term historical uh, trajectory in mind, but these are the effects of certain kinds of practices or procedures that emerged in Europe as dominant procedures. Yeah. Uh, okay. Famines. There were still, you know, famines taking place in various parts of Europe. Uh, Irish famine of the 1840s is a particularly well known example where one and a half million people died. Epidemics, which of course we now know is, is a major killer even, even today. Uh, millions died in epidemics in Europe, all the way to the Spanish flu in 1918 to 20. Uh, and you see public health measures, the mass inoculation or vaccination, uh, the rise of many of the modern medicines like uh, penicillin or antibiotics and so on. All of this comes in the middle of the 20th century, really. Uh, um, until then, millions actually did die in epidemics in, in Europe. What's crucial now, and what's the difference from today, that such mass deaths did not carry significant political costs. That is to say, in the 18th century or 19th century, when people were dying in wars, okay, or in epidemics, it did not lead to huge political costs on the part of the ruling elites. Why? Well, one obvious reason is there was no mass democracy. Well into the 19th century, there, there was no mass democracy. Mass democracy, properly speaking, is a 20th century phenomenon, even in, in Western Europe. Okay, for instance, women actually get the vote 
all across Europe only after the 1920s. Okay, before that, women did not vote. In the 19th century, until the very late 19th century, large parts of the working class did not have the vote. Right? So, the kind of conditions we are used to today in a democracy, when, you know, when, for instance, today, you have these large deaths in, in an epidemic. Uh, and of course, that, that is a very major topic of political discussion, right? Uh, who is to blame, et cetera, et cetera. This was not the case in the 19th century. So in a sense, the, the opportunities of political management of primitive accumulation or the effects of primitive accumulation, right? Uh, there were kind, there were instruments then available or avenues available, which are not available anymore. Let's look at some of the, so we've, th this is what happened in Europe. What about other places where you now have uh, capitalist, modern capitalist production? So I've already mentioned primitive accumulation in, in North America. <coughs> Where, <coughs> sorry, <coughs> uh, American Indian population, <coughs> the indigenous Native American population, <coughs> were expropriated by European colonists to seize their land. This, of course, is <clears throat> very well known. They were either eliminated or they were pushed back further and further west into what in the US was called, were called reservations. They, so they were uh, reserved areas where um, these Native Americans were pushed. These expropriated indigenous peoples were not included in the colonial economic formation. So there were no Native Americans who worked on the lands of the settlers or in the industry. They were simply not part of the economy at all. And of course, they were not part of the political formation also. They were simply not citizens in, in the proper sense. They were completely outside the, the economy, uh, the polity, the society of the white settler population. <clears throat> the abundance of land and other means of production meant that most colonists were small proprietors. We, I've explained this before. Production in plantations in the US South and the Caribbean was carried out by African slaves. The rise of industrial capitalism required a pool of free laborers. This was supplied, one, by the emancipation of slaves. This happens in the middle of the, of the 19th century, uh, after the Civil War, and the new influx of immigrants in the late 19th and early 20th century. Immigrants from the United States, uh, from, from Europe first, and of course, in, from the middle of the 20th century, you have <clears throat> immigration into the US and Canada from many other countries. Um, but this is a much more recent phenomenon. Until the middle of the 19th century, uh, you did not have that crucial condition of, uh, of primitive accumulation, uh, the availability of free wage labor. Uh, this was not there in North America. In what are called late comer capitalist countries. That is to say, capitalist countries which industrialized only in the late 19th century. So we are now no longer talking of Britain or even Western Europe, such as uh, France, Holland. Uh, these, were, these were capitalists which, uh, these were countries which actually began industrializing earlier. The late comer capitalist countries, the classic English way of capitalist development was not available. So Germany in particular and Japan, these are the two great examples of countries which industrialized under, and this is where the role of the state was much more important than in Britain. It industrialized under a centralized authoritarian state 
extracting surplus from the agrarian sector to finance huge military expenditures to create demand for industrially produced capital and consumption goods. So in Germany and Japan, what you had was, of course, a lot of this was politically driven by the competition, political competition with Britain and France, right? So Germany, we know, embarked on this whole mission to uh, have their own colonies. In Germany was not an old colonial power. It, it, it just, in fact, Germany as a state was not unified until 1871. So before that, Germany consisted of, you know, many dozens of small princely uh, principalities, essentially small states. Prussia was only the only large state. Uh, everything else, you know, all the other parts of Germany were small states. Uh, this was unified only in 1871 when you actually have a German state with a German emperor. And then uh, that state embarks on a mission to catch up with Britain, uh, to catch up industrially uh, in order to compete as a world power, as a great power with Britain. And this is the centralized authoritarian state, which essentially extracts surplus from the agricultural sector uh, and builds an army. So the basic impetus for industrialization is provided by military expenditure. So steel uh, is a very, very major part. The steel production is, there is government incentive. Government buys up the steel and there are uh, military factories for producing defense equipment, a whole range of defense equipment. But these are all private capitalists who are given these, these contracts. Uh, so essentially it is a state driven capitalist uh, growth, right? Uh, which then these industries, which once the base is laid for the, the heavy industries, then of course it becomes possible to produce consumption goods as well. Uh, and this is the story of Germany and Japan, militarized, heavily militarized, centralized authoritarian states. This is now here, of course, peasants were dispossessed because any, any kind of industrial development of this kind. So for instance, infrastructure uh, has to be developed. So large uh, factories are built, roads, bridges, uh, seaports, all of these things have to be built, right? Military establishments have to be built cities grow, right? All of this means that farmers, peasants are dispossessed. Their land is taken away. What happens to these people? And this is the key problem of political management. In the case of Germany and Japan, they are simply absorbed, very large parts are absorbed into the army. So essentially it, they become, they are, are uh, provided subsistence provided livelihoods by the state through their military establishments. Don't forget we, until World War II, uh, military establishments were heavily, and especially World War I, before you have the uh, rise of air power, right? Air, uh, World War I, these were enormously large armies. Um, and, and the main warfare was trench warfare. You have artillery uh, across, shooting across, you know, trenches and, and the whole war is decided and the war took very long, you know, World War I, it, it was several years uh, of trench warfare, huge losses, as we just mentioned. Uh, now, so armies were massive uh, and this is where this, a large part of the surplus population was absorbed. Marx actually called this the second way of capitalism. In, the, in volume three, there's a whole discussion of these, this late comer capitalism, uh, capitalist countries, uh, which is called the second way. The classical methods of English capitalism were not available. So this was not the English kind. 
Now, Soviet Union. In some respects, the primitive accumulation in Soviet Union, that's to say separation of direct producers from the means of production, was carried out much like the second wave. Large armies uh, and collective farms. So surplus from agriculture was extracted through collectivization, which took place in Stalin's period. Now this was enormously violent, uh, you know, uh, free, they were not free peasants, of course, uh, you know, they were, they had been uh, freed from the old feudal serfdom system uh, immediately after, well, sometimes actually even before the 1917 revolution, uh, many of the, of the, the old serfdom was already gone in the late uh, Tsarist period. But the kind of dependent farming, uh, all the traces were, uh, were removed. Um, but what happens in, in, in the 1930s in particular was a program of collectivization. That is to say, large state and collective farms are produced. All these small farmers' plots are brought together, uh, improved means of cultivation, which essentially meant tractors, the use of tractors. That becomes the principal uh, technical improvement. But this was essentially primitive accumulation. Again, the role of the state and authoritarian state is very crucial. Uh, and, and there are Soviet theories which, which called them primitive socialist accumulation, right? So these were formerly Marxist theories. So it, this was primitive accumulation. It was understood that any kind of industrialization, even if it's socialist industrialization, will require primitive accumulation. That is to say the small producer has to be separated from the means of production. And so the means of production become socialized that this way, under state. Uh, forms of ownership. Now, primitive accumulation in colonial India. Was there no primitive accumulation in colonial India? Yes, there was. It was carried out in India. One, of course, and Marx himself mentioned this, by colonial officials and European traders who plundered wealth from the country. So Marx does mention the plunder of India as contributing to primitive accumulation in Europe because it, it uh, increased the availability of uh, merchants' capital. It was not just merchants' capital because many of these uh, colonial officials and so on who engaged in so-called private trade, some of it was private trade, some of it was simply taken away uh, by using their greater political power, they just took it away from wealthy Indians. But they took this wealth to England and not just bought wealth, uh, land, uh, they bought stocks and shares in companies. So essentially this went directly into the available pool of capital, uh, which would be employed in industry. So they bought uh, stocks, in uh, or shares in many of these new companies that were floated in 19th century, if, all the way back to the 18th century. Now, <clears throat> in the 19th century in India, Europeans acquired land for tea and coffee plantations and for mining. So you know uh, about the Assam tea, tea plantations. Tea plantations in Assam, which came up in the 19th century, right? These were in the less populated, uh, less cultivated areas of Assam, which were seen to be less disruptive of the local peasant agriculture. So these were lands which were uh, essentially uh, marked off and given to Europeans for, for uh, setting up plantations. And the labor, don't forget, again, you have this interesting problem of availability of labor. In Assam, at this time, certainly, uh, most ordinary people were engaged in some kind of agriculture of their own, okay? 
So there was really no availability of local free labor. So the pea plantations in Assam and later on in uh, Northern Bengal, in, in the Duars, in the what, you know, Jalpaiguri, Alipur Duar, and places like that, the workers had to be supplied from Chotanagpur, uh, you know, areas which are now in uh, Jharkhand, uh, very largely. So you have Santal, Orao uh, tribal laborers who were brought in to provide for the labor force in the tea plantations, okay? Because local labor was not available. Okay, British companies also built railways and other infrastructure with support of the colonial state. Now this, you know, for instance, building railways, uh, building infrastructure, meaning townships, uh, seaports, uh, bridges, roads, all of these things, cantonments, army cantonments, right? These were all would have, would have displaced local populations. Yeah, they were dispossessed. It was the state which managed this. Now, in terms of this management of dispossession, the colonial state actually faced an important political problem, right? In the vast agrarian sector, the colonial state was faced with the political problem of large scale dispossession, which led to peasant revolts as well as famines. Now, some of these examples of uh, peasant uh, revolts in the 19th century, 19th century colonial India, British India, show this. For instance, uh, some of you may know of the Indigo rebellions in the middle of the 19th century in Bengal. Now, the indigo rebellions were essentially European indigo farmers. They wanted to wanted peasants to cultivate indigo instead of rice uh, or paddy, right? And they basically used the power of the local landlords, if possible, to force uh, peasants to cultivate indigo. Uh, now, this led to uh, fairly large scale resistance and revolt. Okay, there was a whole series of this and Bengal was an important case, but similar things happened in, in Western India, for instance. Uh, and the, the result was that the colonial state was careful to protect the tenancy rights of peasants so as to prevent large scale evictions. The evictions, since, since this was a lot of it had become market regulated, evictions would have been possible if landlords were interested in throwing out uh, you know, a poor tenant and handing over the land to some uh, enterprising farmer or plantation owner, just as happened in New England, for instance. This is a market, market response. So if, if, if uh, landlords were able to do this, as for instance did happen in, in some cases in the case of the indigo plantations, right? Then of course, you would get large numbers of peasants who would be evicted and the uh, government would be faced with this problem of what to do with these people who would <clears throat> obviously create a political problem. So as a result, through the middle of the 19th century, <clears throat> what you have is on the one hand, <clears throat> the capitalist state was interested in pro promoting capitalist property. So a whole range of laws and institutions were created in order to facilitate the rise of modern capitalist property ownership. So for instance, laws of contract, the whole stock markets, the regulation of currency, uh, all of these things uh, were to facilitate the you know, proper, clear, legally administered uh, property rights, okay? Uh, settlement of disputes over property in a, in a legal way. So all of these things were, were uh, promoted, but the, the colonial state was always careful to protect the tenancy rights of peasants because they were afraid that large scale eviction of peasants would lead 
to a serious political law and order problem. Now this set an enduring condition of post-colonial capitalist development. This is something which continued well into the 20th century. And in fact, into the post-colonial period that large scale peasant evictions were always became politically a difficult matter to handle. It's not that it didn't happen. And of course we will see how it, it has suddenly picked up a, a very much in the more recent periods in particularly uh, since the 1990s. But until then, the general uh, position in politics was that small farmers should be protected. The rights of small farmers and their, uh, their uh, security of uh, possession should be protected. Otherwise, you would land up in particular political difficulties because of the uh, sudden <clears throat> emergence of large uh, sections of landless people without any means of subsistence. Now, how did capitalist development emerge <clears throat> Uh, in post-colonial India after independence. Initially, and this is true from the 1940s and 50s, initially Indian capitalists looked to the new post-colonial state to mobilize the capital for heavy industry and infrastructure. This created a large state sector of industry and financial services, much like the second wave of capitalism. We, which we uh, saw in the case of Germany and Japan. The consumer goods sector was left to private capital. So some of you might know of the history of, of Indian planning, for instance. In the, 18, in the 1940s, in fact, a group of major Indian industrialists, Indian businessmen, put together what was called the Bombay Plan. So uh, there were... Industry. The Tatas were not part of it, but Thakurdas, uh, Sriram, these people were part of this Bombay plan, which essentially said that it was not possible for private industry in India to actually start, to actually invest in heavy industry, in uh, sectors like steel, for instance, or cement, for instance, which required heavy investment and the returns were slow to come. It would take many years before a steel plant would actually make profits. Okay, so the argument was that the state, the government must take over this responsibility. You know, open steel plants, cement plants in the public sector. Infrastructure, major infrastructure has to be provided for by the state. So new townships, airports, seaports, roads, bridges, railways, these are all areas in which the state should raise revenues and invest. This would create the industrial infrastructure or base. And then private capital can come in and take advantage of those conditions and uh, promote uh, the consumer goods sector. This was the original idea in 1940s. So, so the idea of planning in India was not merely, you know, some uh, socialists in the Congress like uh, Nehru or Subhash Bose, they didn't invent the idea of uh, planning. I mean, it was already there very much. Although the Congress did have what was called the National Planning Committee, which was set up in 1937, uh, which in fact basically took this decision that after independence, when power is transferred, the main objective in, the, in relation to the economy would be to promote industrial development, rapid industrial development, and the state must take the lead. 
So what emerged was uh, this uh, planned economy with strict controls over private capital, but, but, and this was the important political condition, the popular base of the nationalist movement, which was essentially consisted of rural populations, the rural agricultural population, it, that made it necessary for the state to protect small farmers and craftspeople. This, of course, was represented most vocally by the so-called Gandhian wing of the Congress, who were in principle against industrialization or heavy industrialization. And they were the main uh, pressure group which wanted protection of small industry, small crafts, handicrafts, and small industry. So you have things like the Khadi board and so on, which were set up uh, precisely to protect the small artisans. And, uh, and of course, there was much political pressure to protect small farmers. Now, this continued more or less into the 1970s. The 80s were a period of transition. Uh, in 1991, the regime of licensing and regulating private industry ended. Right? This was when Manmohan Singh was uh, the finance minister in Narasimha Rao's <coughs> uh, government. Uh, 1991, he announced what was called the liberalization of the economy. Uh, so there was greater entry of foreign capital and consumer goods, several state sectors including transport, telecommunication, infrastructure, mining, banking, insurance, all of this was open to private capital. And this led in the, in the near term to rapid annual growth uh, of the economy. Uh, the growth rates reached eight to 9% every year uh, until 2007, eight. Then of course you had the global financial slump. And of course, ever since then, the rates have, have fallen. But this spurt in capitalist growth led to a new phase of primitive accumulation. Okay, so if primitive accumulation did continue through the 50s, 60s, 70s, but it was kept in control, largely because of political pressures on the one hand to protect small uh, manufacturing craftspeople and to protect the small farmers. Okay, this was um, this was part of the political uh, consequences of the national movement. But by the 1990s, that pressure was relatively diminished. It was not so vocal and the attempt was made for a more rapid capitalist development with the private sector taking the lead, okay? This created a new phase of primitive accumulation in India. Okay, any questions so far? Because then we will have to move back to the consequences of this phase of primitive accumulation and uh, go back to Shanyal's argument. Uh, any questions up so far? Anything that is not clear <clears throat> or you need more information? Um. Sir, yes. I just wanted a clarification on, so you said that um, that set up the uh, enduring condition of post-colonial capitalist development. So is it because that the tenancy rights were preserved and that the whole of the production was not for the market, like which is why we are calling it a post-capitalist development, sir? Yeah. So essentially what, what happens in this period in, from in the 50s, 60s, 70s, for instance, one, you have land reforms of different kinds. This is part of the Congress program, the, the uh, ruling power, the Congress. They had, uh, the Congress had from the 1930s 
basically said that the old forms of landlordism must go you know the big zamindars must be must not be there so in 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 most states of india uh, you have legislation which which essentially uh, did not allow uh, big landlords to continue holding large tracts of land so you have land ceiling legislations for instance on how much agricultural land a single family can own this varied from state to state but most states had some of this uh, legislation which essentially meant that the old kind of zamindari landlordism that was no longer uh, viable uh, any more you had a new kind of land land ownership uh, and use of um, large lands which is of course the new big farmer but we'll come to that in a minute the the big farmer or uh, what in for instance bengal is would be called the joddar but the old jomidar form the the big jomidars they were no longer because the zamindari was abolished uh, and in any case with the land ceiling acts and so on uh, the large holders of landed property they uh, they were no longer there but small farmers were largely protected through various kinds of laws uh, for instance agricultural land could not be immediately converted to non agricultural land you had to go through a whole process of formalization so the only kind of land transactions say you know of agricultural land would take place between farmers uh, so an outsider who wants to build a factory they would have to secure a whole set of government permissions and licenses to buy out a farmer take over the agricultural land and then uh, build a factory there so this this you you will you will know this this is essentially the problem which which uh, uh, was faced in the case of shingur for instance the state the government had to come in to uh, buy out the land pay compensation to to the farmers and then hand it over to a private company to build a a factory so these were the forms uh, in 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 different states there were different sets of laws but essentially an attempt to protect the small farmer and the small farm uh, which was a carry over of the old idea which comes from the colonial times that if large numbers of peasants farmers are dispossessed then they would start agitating they would create a political problem and that was to be avoided so as you as you saw in the in the shingur case for instance that the the agitation uh, actually led to serious political consequences uh, there were similar things that happened earlier too uh, so that's that's the enduring condition that i was suggesting this began to change from the 1990s right and of course shingur was an interesting case because on the one hand the government was interested in promoting industrial development and and therefore making uh, making conditions easier for private capital to find land where factories could be set up uh, but on the other hand the old condition the old political condition had not actually gone away uh, so that's the uh, point there okay Uh, so i had a question yes sir please uh, sir so the land reforms in the 80s in bengal by the cp uh, well left front uh, what the um, was it socialist accumulation then well, there was no socialist accumulation there no 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 what it was was essentially making it possible for small owner farmers to be more viable so for instance the whole uh, land reform for instance a major part was to give titles to the land to those who only cultivated earlier as share croppers so these were the borgadars or bhatchashi right who cultivated the land of land owners just took up you know leased that land and cultivated on a term where they were supposed to hand over a certain proportion of uh their produce 
to the landlord. So what the uh, a la a major effect of the land reform legislation in West Bengal in the uh, late 70s, early 80s was to make, to give tenancy rights to these borgadars. So the borgadar or sharecropper could not be evicted by the landlord. Earlier, what would happen is that landlords had the right to not appoint the same borgadar the, uh, the next time. If, for instance, the landlord was unhappy with this borgadar, or if somebody else came in and was prepared to offer a, a some somewhat higher uh, share, then the borgadar would uh, would go. The older one would go. There was no recognized claim of the borgadar on that land. Very often, in fact, some or sometimes the landlord would say, "I'm not going to cultivate on these terms anymore. I will cultivate this land myself. I will employ wage laborers, agricultural laborers, and cultivate this land myself." But this is what was protected. The rights of the borgadar was protected. So, so this is in a, in a sense an extension of the idea of protecting the small farmer. So the, the, this land reform, uh, land legislation was trying to protect small farmers who were earlier unprotected. So they were still dependent on the landlord. These, their rights were protected. So this is not socialist accumulation. Socialist accumulation would actually mean converting uh, owner farmer lands into some kind of collective property uh, under state auspices. So uh, owner farmer lands would be combined, put together. These kinds of proposals have come in because uh, one of the main difficulties of small peasant agriculture is because the size of the plots are so small, uh, there is a, a limit to how much technical uh, progress you can you can make in terms of the techniques of production. You cannot employ a sort of large tractor production, for instance, on these small uh, farms. So sometimes it has been argued that these small plots should be combined into a large plot where a lot of other kinds of technical equipment can be used and production can be increased. Uh, but this requires either cooperation among the uh, small owners themselves, so they set up cooperatives so that large uh, production can take place, or it will require collectivization. And in India, collectivization certainly has never been attempted anywhere. Uh, cooperation too, there's very little example of actually uh, cooperation in terms of actual farming. There is There are cooperatives in, for marketing. Uh, so you have sugar cooperatives, you have milk cooperatives, those kinds of things, uh, you know, some parts of India that's quite widespread, uh, uh, cooperatives among producers, but that's largely for marketing purposes, not for actually uh, cooperating in terms of, that, that's to say, combining the means of production. That is very rare. Uh, you know, it, it's not happened on a big scale in India. Thank you. Okay, so uh, let's move on. What are the consequences of primitive accumulation? So, because of this new phase of primitive accumulation, what we are seeing is the growth of a vast informal sector, okay? Which we see every day in our towns and cities. What is this informal sector? It's migration from rural areas, especially into medium and small sized towns. So in big cities like uh, Bombay or Calcutta, uh, you've already always had people coming in from rural areas. You also had, for instance, seasonal migration at one time, where in the lean seasons in 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 the uh, in in agriculture, people would come into the cities because there was no work and no food in 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 the villages. They would come to the cities looking for work or sometimes simply to beg uh, and you know, for a few months, and then they could return when there was agriculture or farming again in the rural areas. Uh, but the new migration 
is, is of a different kind. It's first of all, much bigger in size, but it's also from people who are coming in, people who are moving into new occupations in urban areas, uh, especially in medium and small size towns. And uh, that's, that's one of the major phenomenon that's happening in India. The big cities are not necessarily growing in terms of population anymore. In the last 20 years or so, the major metropolitan cities have not seriously grown in population except for Delhi to some extent. But uh, medium and small size towns have grown very fast. They're still growing very fast. And this is where you get uh, the new informal sectors uh, in a very big way. What you also have is the spread of non-agricultural occupation in rural areas. This is also quite recent. In many, many states of, in, of India now, uh, Tamil Nadu, for instance, I think Maharashtra, uh, possibly uh, Karnataka too, uh, that of those people who live in rural areas, a majority of the people living in the villages are not in agriculture. They are in other occupations, non-agricultural occupations. This is also a very new phenomenon and is a consequence of primitive accumulation. It essentially means that small peasant agriculture is crumbling. It is no longer viable, not necessarily because people are being forcibly evicted, but because it is more and more difficult now, more less and less viable for small peasant agriculture to continue on the old basis, either because costs of production are higher or because the farms have become smaller and smaller because families have fragmented. So from one generation to another, for instance, if there was a, a single farm in one generation, the next generation, the, uh, the children may separate and the farms become smaller because the farms are partitioned. And so small family farms have become smaller and less and less viable. Uh, market conditions have made, uh, for instance, in many cases, costs of production are far more expensive than what is available uh, by selling the produce. So the non-viability of small peasant agriculture means that in many farming communities, it may not be everybody in the family, but large numbers of people in the family who earlier would have been engaged in agriculture are looking for other kinds of work, either in the village itself or in some nearby town or cities. There is also, as we all know, the phenomenon of migrant labor. That is to say, people who earlier would have worked, found work in the village, uh, are moving to other parts of the country uh, in order to work in usually non-agricultural uh, laboring occupations. Okay, but mostly none of that is in the formal sector. Nobody is actually formally employed in some industrial uh, company. All of this work is short-term contract work, contractual work. And so it is very much a part of what we call the informal sector. Now, this is where Kulan Channel has made his theoretical claim. His argument is this, <clears throat> that post-colonial countries today do not have the options available earlier, options such as mass emigration, conscription into the army, or deaths in epidemics and famines for managing primitive accumulation. Post-colonial development brings into the open a feature of capitalism that was obscured in its European history. Capital necessarily creates its own outside, which is not pre-capital, but something new. Okay, 
the new dispossessed population is not a reserved army of labor. It is redundant. It is unnecessary to capital's accumulation economy. In other words, what Shanal is saying that primitive accumulation, as always, is throwing out more people than can be absorbed in the new industry. This is even more acute today because the new industries are usually always more capital intensive. The more there is accumulation, and this go back to Marx, this is an old uh, argument that you get in Marx, that as capital reproduces itself, accumulation goes on because of technical progress, right? New technologies are invented, which makes uh, the product cheaper. That is what drives uh, capitalist industrialization forward. And that is what has been happening in the Indian is industry as, uh, as well. Think of, think of the motor car industry and the, the old Hindustan ambassador and all the new cars that you see now. The new cars are technically far more efficient. There are many, many more features, right? Compared to the old ambassador, right? But the new motor car companies will employ much fewer laborers. The laborers you need will be much more skilled because a lot of the production will be automated. They will, be, they will depend on high technology right, which will require skill, but you don't need the large number of laborers that you would have been employed in the old uh, Hind Motor factory in, uh, in Uttar Pada, for instance, right, Hind Motor, uh, so, so that, so therefore, the new industry, while it accumulates and grows, actually needs less and less labor, it will absorb less and less labor. So this absolute surplus, which is created by dispossession, because capital will need land, capital will need townships, capital will need bridges and roads and airports and seaports and all of that, right? So people will be dispossessed, but that dispossession will not necessarily all the people who are dispossessed will not necessarily be absorbed because capital does not need that absolute surplus population. So primitive accumulation largely destroys the old pre-capitalist economy, especially traditional small scale agriculture. But what is created is a huge sector of informal production and services embedded in market relations, but driven not by the logic of accumulation, but the satisfaction of livelihood needs. Shannal calls this the need economy. Okay, now this is Shannal's cru crucial argument. This is, this is different from Marx. Okay, because what Shannal is saying that this surplus population, this ab absolute surplus population creates a huge sector of informal production and services, right? There's, we'll, we'll come to all the varieties of things that happen in this informal sector. But this sector is not traditional because everything happens in the market, under market conditions, right? The same market conditions that apply for formal industry. Just think of, of the, uh, you know, people who are selling things on, uh, on the pavement. A lot of it is actually produced again in the informal sector by mostly by women in cottage industries, right? But these products are being sold in the market on the street, for instance, where just behind these uh, hawkers, there will be actual shops, licensed shops, which will sell licensed products from factories in the same market. So the hawkers who are selling all these things are selling under the same market conditions. They are effectively competing with the products of formal industry. 
and they have to compete in order to survive. Okay, now how do they manage to survive? And Shannal's argument is that these people are engaging in this informal production and services only to satisfy their livelihood needs. They are not engaging in production in order to accumulate. So whereas formal industry has to operate according to the logic of accumulation, is capital accumulating or not? In other words, in a capitalist industry, if a company is making losses for several years, the company will have to shut down, right? Because there is no accumulation happening. Whereas, a, let's say, you know, a small, uh, somebody who has a sewing machine, a, 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 a woman in, in some kind of suburb who has a contract for supplying, you know, stitch clothes, for instance, right? Uh, that person will continue to work even if the returns happen to be less because that is the only way of surviving. So what will happen is that person will reduce the consumption in the family. That person may take some additional work uh, in order to compensate for these losses, but they don't go out of business that easily because they're not competing according to the logic of accumulation, even though they are competing in the same market, right? But their interest in engaging in this informal production is to meet the needs, livelihood needs of their families, okay? And this is what Shannal is calling a need economy. So what Shannal's argument is, on the one hand, there is an accumulation economy, and on the other, there is a need economy, okay? The accumulation economy is in fact capital. Capital operates and grows in this accumulation economy, right? Driven by the logic of accumulation. But the informal sector, all these people who are dispossessed of their older means of production, and are flocking into these towns and, and cities, they are only interested, they are motivated by the, the desire to satisfy their livelihood needs. So they will, they also engage in the same market, but that is not the logic of capital. That is the logic of need, right? That is the logic of need or the logic of subsistence. So post-colonial politics demands, and this is the crucial argument, the reversal of the effects of primitive accumulation. So what Shanal is saying is now, because the other, the old methods of political management send these people off to the Americas, that is no longer possible, right? Take all these people into the army. That is no longer possible because armies are no longer dependent are no longer those heavy infantry armies anymore. Armies are also highly technical, technically sophisticated. In fact, many of the Western armies actually now operate, uh, engage in essentially air warfare, where you don't even need to send troops anywhere. You just, you know, hit targets uh, from some remote uh, control room and targets can be hit many thousands of miles away. So it's a, it's a very different kind of warfare again. You don't have those old um, you know, armies of millions of uh, infantry soldiers. Uh, so that is no longer available. The old methods of, well, let them just die, right? Which, which would have been possible in the 18th century, 19th century, but people just die of hunger, famines. It happened in the 19th century in India lots of famines, all the way to 1943, for instance. Even after independence, there have been famines. But it is politically too expensive, right? So you cannot, the government cannot allow large-scale deaths by starvation anymore because politically that is not possible. So this requires 
reversing the effect. So on the one hand, accumulation must be allowed to go on, capital must expand, but the necessary primitive accumulation that will accompany this capitalist growth, that the effects of that primitive accumulation have to be controlled, to be managed. And they are managed by reversing the effects of primitive accumulation. What is this process of reversal? The post-colonial state emerges as a mediator between corporate capital, the owners of capital, and what is often called the political society or the political organization of these informal workers to negotiate the claims of livelihood, housing, education, health, etc., of the dispossessed population. So go back to what we were discussing earlier. In the earlier phase, the attempt was to keep the agricultural population, the small owners in the villages, let them give, provide them with conditions so that they can continue their subsistence in agriculture, protect small peasant agriculture. After the 1990s, this is no longer feasible. Small peasant agriculture can no longer be protected simply by means of land legislation or anything else, right? That is crumbling. So small farmers will be dispossessed. Small farmers will have to find some source of uh, uh, livelihood outside of agriculture. The idea therefore is for the government to enter into this process as a mediator between corporate capital on the one hand and this mass of dispossessed population on the other, and to negotiate their claims of livelihood. This can be done either through authoritarian decisions, that is to say an authoritarian state, uh, government or state can do this by directly uh, intervening and laying down conditions, or it can be done through democratic compromise. But the principal method is to use a part of the revenues from the capitalist growth sector to reverse the effects of primitive accumulation. So effectively, what governments do is they tax the capitalist sector, right? They put corporate taxes, taxes on the uh, profits that companies make. Out of these taxes, of course, these taxes are from the bulk of the revenues of the state. But a part of that is used to essentially subsidize or provide benefits to this dispossessed population through various schemes. And uh, we will come to this in a minute. So Chanel describes post-colonial capitalism as the sum of capital's accumulation economy and the informal need economy. These two things together comprises post-colonial capitalism. On the one hand, so capitalism includes the accumulation economy, which is capital proper, the domain of capital proper, and what Sanal will call non-capital or the informal need economy. Okay, and don't forget the earlier argument this informal need economy is not a survival of the old traditional peasant economy. This is a completely new thing, right? This is not protection of small peasant agriculture. Small peasant agriculture can no longer be protected. Okay, so small farmers will be dispossessed. This is now understood. If they are dispossessed, how can they be helped or supported in their livelihood needs. This becomes the new political problem, okay? And so there is an informal need economy which is created. And part of the profits of the capitalist accumulation sector through taxes, and then part of these taxes are converted into various schemes 
for the support of the informal need economy. And we will see what these techniques are. So if, if there's any confusion about this basic log logic, please ask, because this is the crucial argument that Shannal is making. Uh, yes. uh, I have a question. I'm sorry to interrupt. Uh, when we are talking about uh, the rehabilitation of the informal need economy or the people, small farmers who are being dispossessed because of the emergence of the informal need economy, are we then looking towards the emergence of the welfare state? Uh, would it be right to understand it in that way? No, it's not, because we, we'll come to this later. Because the welfare state is one where benefits are available to all citizens as a claim of citizenship. So for instance, when you have, let's say something like the National Health Service, right? Many, many European countries have this. So any citizen can go to a hospital, a, a public hospital and get treatment free of cost. Okay, it doesn't matter who you are, what, what your income is and so on and so forth. If, if there is, for instance, uh, free uh, education, of course, most, most uh, European countries will have free school education for all. Okay, even university education in many uh, European countries is free for citizens. It doesn't matter who you are. It is part of the universal claims of citizenship. But for instance, the availability of ration, subsidized ration, food rations in India through PDS, right? Ration cards. That is restricted to certain categories of people. You have to qualify. And the qualification is usually what is called below the poverty line. So there is a, a, a government lays down a particular level of uh, consumption and says anyone who cannot meet this consumption through the ordinary market conditions will be given this support, right? And a whole range of schemes, we'll come to this in a minute, which are for spe specific groups of people, targeted assistance for specific groups of people, right? Who are identified precisely as Shannal would say, as belonging to the need economy. Belonging to the need economy, okay? So what are these techniques? Direct transfers to specific dispossessed groups through poverty removal programs. So we have lots of poverty removal programs. So for instance, subsidized food, guaranteed employment for specific periods. So you have, for instance, things like um, the uh, food for, there used to be food for work. Uh, you have the, um, what is it called? Narega, the uh, Narega, Rural Employment Guarantee Scheme, right? Uh, 100, 100, what is it called? 100, 100 days uh, work, guaranteed 100 days work. So housing loans, for instance, you have Avaz Jojana and so on and so forth, right? Uh, these are all transfers through the state. So where is this money coming from? It is coming from state revenues, the taxes that the government raise imposes essentially on the growth sector. Taxes imposed on those corporate profits as well as incomes of those people who depend on the formal sector, who are employed in the formal sector right, on, on people with high incomes, right, who pay income tax, for instance. And these are mostly people who are in the formal sector. So that is where the transfer is taking place. Okay. Second, there is subsidized public services for specific groups in transport, health, schooling, etc. So for instance, certain kinds, categories of uh, health services, may be available free or at small cost to people who have particular kinds, who, who have the benefits of particular schemes, okay? Even transport, for instance, in many places, for instance, uh, let's say women, 
uh, may have uh, cheaper transport allowed. And there are many places where, for instance, women are allowed to travel free in public transport, right? So uh, schooling, for instance, again, in most of India now, you have a complete bifurcation between public schooling and private schooling, right? And private schooling is for people who are mostly in what we will call the formal sector, corporate sector. Their children go to public schools where there are obviously large fees and so on have to be paid. And there is a whole public education system, which is essentially free, uh, you know, government schools, which are essentially free. But again, this is not technically speaking the welfare state anymore because it is not available to everybody. Okay, providing easy loans for small businesses and self-employment. These are specific schemes you have for self-employment schemes, uh, small businesses, there are all kinds of easy loans that are made available. Then you have, you have these, you have uh, other methods which are not strictly speaking transfers of any uh, resources, allowing informal sector to violate tax laws, labor laws, pollution laws that apply to the corporate sector. So for instance, think of all the pavement stalls. For instance. Every city and town in India is full of this. Okay. Now these pavement stalls are, you, are always on land which they don't own. They're on public land. Right? The pavement stalls are on roadside stalls, unlike a formal shop where you actually have to rent a shop in order to start a business, right? You pay a landlord, you know, this is not, uh, you know, there is no landlord here, right? There is no formal rent system. There may be, and this is precisely the political management. These people may have to pay something every week to the local police station. That is certainly possible. Or maybe some local political leader. Okay. But that is informal. That is not a formal mechanism. But the interesting thing is that the government allows this. Allows this because politically, this is a form of management. If this was simply prohibited, then the government would be faced with an even greater difficulty of what to do with these people, right? Where will they find their subsistence? This is one way in which people themselves find some method of subsistence, but they can only compete. And don't forget, these pavement uh, sellers are competing with the formal sellers. So if they're selling clothes or if they're, they're selling all kinds of stationery, all sorts of things, there are formal shops and they're in the same market. Okay, so how do they manage to compete? They manage to compete in a sense because they don't pay taxes. They very often don't pay for their electricity, right? They, uh, they clearly don't uh, um, observe pollution laws or uh, even labor laws. You know, you find often, you know, children being employed and so on and so forth, right? And we are simply talking now of, of uh, you know, it's a pavement stalls, which everyone can see. There, are, there is a lot of informal household work, production actually, production which you don't actually see in sweatshops, in all kinds of production conditions, which would never be allowed in a formal registered company, right? There is violation, but this violation is, as it were, accepted or admitted by the government. And this is done through essentially a kind of political negotiation, right? And the negotiation would allow for so specific groups to build unauthorized housing, vending stalls, production units, etc. All of this is part. But this must be done without jeopardizing the legal structure of property. So this is the, the, the real political problem here that the state has to face. You have to allow these informal sector people to violate tax laws, et cetera, et cetera. 
right? But what if formal shop owners were to say, well, we, do, we shouldn't be asked to pay for licenses. We shouldn't be asked to observe all these rules about when the shops can open, when the shops can close, you know, all the formal rules that every municipality has. Why should we obey, obey that? But that is what has to be maintained. On the one hand, the legal structure of private property has to be preserved. And at the same time, various violations have to be accepted on the part of some people, not all, right? No violations will be allowed in the, in the uh, formal sector. The formal sector has to pay taxes, the formal sector, because otherwise, of course, the whole, whole structure will fall, collapse, right? So how can this be done that you will accept or admit certain kinds of violations for some sector, for this informal need sector, and yet insist that all those formal rules have to be maintained because the formal structure of property has to be maintained in the formal sector. How can you do both of these things? And this is usually done, right, through administrative decisions that treat the specific cases as exceptions. So there is some, and you know, this is the entire art, as you might say, of managing this coexistence of a formal corporate economy uh, or an accumulation economy and a need economy at the same time. How can they coexist? And they coexist essentially by allowing for all of these transgressions, et cetera, as some sort of exceptions. And the exceptions have to be justified. The exceptions don't always stand up because as you know, very often, you know, a court of law might intervene and say, you cannot have all these polluting uh, industries in the city. You have to take them out, right? And so the government is then has to uh, find some way of accommodating, rehabilitating all of these people somewhere else so that the court order can be maintained. So these are all balancing uh, me uh, mechanisms and government has to keep make, you know, managing this through a system by which they say these, uh, these are only exceptions because there are certain exceptional circumstances which make it necessary for us to allow these things for the time being. So in the form of electoral democracy as in India, there is a flexible framework of negotiation with this politically organized informal sector. So a very important condition of this is that the informal sector must be politically organized in some way. They have to find political leaders, political parties. They may organize their own uh, unions and so on in order to carry out this kind of political negotiation. But it's only within a kind of democratic framework, electoral democracy, because there is the power of the vote, right? The crucial thing here is that these people in the informal sector are also citizens with the power to vote. And that is in a sense their capital, right? With which they can negotiate with whichever government happens to be in power, right? And produce that condition uh, where uh, they are able to survive in their need economy. So many of these political compromises are local, they are contextual, and they are temporary, right? They can change. If political balance shifts, then that, that particular compromise no longer holds. So that is broadly speaking, Shannal's intervention. Let me just end with, uh, by discussing this uh, intervention by David Harvey. Some of you may know this or may come across this in future. So David Harvey speaks of a new phase of 
accumulation by dispossession in the context of the shift from manufacturing to finance capital in Western economies. He is speaking largely of uh, the Un United States or North America and uh, Europe, uh, where he is saying there is a new phase, and he's speaking mostly of the 1990s, 80s, 90s, uh, 2000, that phase. Uh, a new phase of accumulation by dispossession where the old manufacturing economies are gone in the United States. Most of the profits of capital are from finance, right? So what you have is that the old working class is no, in the old industrial working class is, is vanishing. And most people are dependent on the financial market, they, they, whatever their savings happen to be, uh, their property, like for instance, houses, housing, all of this is tied to the financial market. And so house values go up and down depending on property prices in these markets. And many of these markets, because they're so heavily financialized, operate on the basis of purely speculative, speculative profits. As a result, sometimes, and of course, in, in the United States, you may know there was, there was one, a huge, what was called the housing bubble, which burst. So there were all of these people, so housing suddenly became very cheap. So people were buying houses. Uh, even people with small savings would buy houses. They were mortgaged houses, so you make a small down payment, and then you have to keep paying every month. Okay, but you have a house. But then the market suddenly collapsed. And whatever was the value of your house, that became almost nothing. Suddenly there was no value in the house. So as a result, many people had to give up their houses. They just lost them. Now, this is what Harvey is calling accumulation by disposition. What happened is that the banks or the mortgage companies and so on, which had given these loans, would now take over these houses. Right? They would take over these houses because people are no longer able to pay the, the mortgage uh, installments. So they, they take, the houses are taken over. And this becomes a stock of capital in the hands of major companies, which they can later then dispose of the land, sell of the house, whatever. So much new accumulation takes place through the acquisition of assets in real estate, housing, pension funds, that's another, another important part. So most elderly people are, are, or retired people have pension, but the pension is invested in the market. This is not unlike government pensions in our country, right? At least so far. The pension funds are fully invested in the market. So if the market collapses, stock markets collapse, your pension amounts may be gone completely. You may completely lose whatever savings you had in the pension fund. So pension funds, et cetera, by speculative financial operations, the result is the dispossession of millions of people with small property. All right, now, this is what Harvey is calling a new kind of accumulation by dispossession. But what you have to notice is that this is very different from primitive accumulation, right? Why is it different? Because this accumulation by dispossession does not mean the separation of the primary producer from the means of production. These people who are losing their assets or their properties today in the United States or Europe, for instance, they were not primary producers. They were already either workers, salaried workers, you know, workers in factories, whatever, right? The dispossessed people had been separated from primary production in agriculture or crafts a long time ago. All right. So this is this is simply within the entire accumulation sector that there is dispossession and further accumulation. It is not dispossession from a traditional sector which is creating this surplus labor, right? And now an informal sector or need economy, which is created. This is a very different phenomenon. Okay, so it is misleading to include 
primitive accumulation within the broader category of accumulation by disposition. Primitive accumulation means a very different thing because it means a certain transformation of an old economy, a pre-capitalist economy into a form of capital, right? Where there is a capitalist accumulation economy on the one side and capital itself creates a new need economy, right? This new need economy is not an old economy because now you have a need economy with dispossessed people. But these dispossessed people are not part of capital, part of the sector of capital. They are outside. And yet the two together comprise post-colonial capitalism, right? This is Shandal's claim. So let me finally summarize what the situation is now in the 21st century, in a sense. Primitive accumulation, this is, we have come far from Marx's discussion in the 19th century, right? Capitalism itself has changed. <clears throat> uh, and it's, it's clearly now spread all across the world, but it has not transformed the entire world, the traditional world in the image of capital as Marx had foreseen. Something else has happened. So what's going to happen? Primitive accumulation will continue in the emerging capitalist economies of Asia, Africa, and South America, right? Because capital uh, accumulation will continue now uh, at, by dispossessing people from primary producers. That is still the pr process here. There will be various forms of political management of primitive accumulation. The more authoritarian forms may deliver speedier growth, but will involve high costs in terms of coercion, violence, and the stability of the state. Now, this is interesting because if you compare, for instance, the situation, let us say, in many Southeast Asian countries in, in, in the 70s, 80s. So think of the transformations, uh, well, Korea earlier, for instance, South Korea from the 60s onwards, completely authoritarian form of government, uh, but huge transformations. Uh, and uh, there were there was costs, there were costs, there was coercion, violence, uh, many Southeast Asian countries. And of course, the biggest example here is China. The transformation of the Chinese economy into now one of the the great sort of properly uh, industrial economies of the world, okay, authoritarian, and it delivers speedier growth. There's no question of huge accumulation, but on the other hand, what is less known is that in China too, there is a whole need economy. China too, Chinese cities have enormously large informal occupations, informal sectors, slum populations, which are politically managed, okay? Necessarily, because in fact, they move into the city uh, because there is nothing available in rural areas, even though there is, there is greater control over the movement of populations uh, because you know there are internal passes and so on, which people need to migrate from one place to another. But despite that, Despite that, you know, many, most of the large industrial cities of China today have these uh, significantly large informal sector populations. Uh, but as I said, there is coercion, there is violence, and possibly uh, impact on the stability of the state. The more democratic forms will be slow and messy, as in India, but it may afford greater flexibility and the possibility of course correction. That is to say, things that don't work out, there will be political pressure and something else will be invented, okay? However, primitive accumulation on the one hand and struggles for survival in the need economy on the other will persist for a long time. So this is in fact, the key 
dynamic today in post colonial uh, capitalist economies so this is this is chanel's main argument here that what you have is not just some kind of transition from pre capitalist economies to capitalist economy that transition narrative does not operate what you have is the creation of a post colonial capitalist economy which consists on the one side of an accumulation economy where the logic is that of accumulation and at the same time there is created a domain of what sanal calls non capital right this is not traditional production this is the whole informal sector which is not traditional it is dependent on the same market conditions everything operates as commodities here except except the employment of free wage laborers that condition does not operate in the need economy because it is largely self employment family labor is the principal means of uh, production here whether whether actual production or services right it is largely family labor and the motivation there what drives that forward is simply the logic of subsistence which essentially means that even if the uh, um, enterprise does not apparently does not make profits from the market it will still continue simply by reducing consumption right people will simply where they were used to let's say a better condition of housing the children were think of think of what has happened for instance because of the uh, of the recent lockdowns and so on the big uh, uh, blow has come on the informal sector as we all know is the informal sector which is because of the lack of transport and so so think of think of just these 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 possibilities people cannot don't have transport to come into the cities okay so a lot of the uh, and then uh, uh, you know if, if there's a lockdown even street vending and and the small enterprises they cannot run so what happens they don't go out of business necessarily what happens is people simply reduce consumption they simply manage to tide over this period right by borrowing by somehow finding some other source of uh, or by let's say you know or reducing consumption in this way children no longer go to school they join in some kind of you know local you know household uh, work uh, in order to keep going right it that's the logic of subsistence it's it's a very different logic in a similar situation in the capitalist growth economy right companies would simply shut down they would simply shut down they would go bankrupt they would shut down that's the difference in 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 these two sectors right capital and non capital but within the same formation which is the formation of the post colonial uh, capitalism okay we have to stop uh, there uh, prasanth there are there are some questions but i think uh, the, these questions can, can be uh, emailed to you uh, or, or yes you can email them to me yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, by students i think two of them yeah. uh, i i'm i'm now stopping the live stream unless there are any questions pertinent questions from the students uh, i have a few questions but uh, i'll just email them <laughs>